Our Bible reading today is from two parts of the Bible, the first book of Thessalonians and then a section from the very end of second Thessalonians. And this is the final in our series on both 1 and 2 Thessalonians. Both of these sections have Paul talking about work, encouraging the Thessalonians to work, not to be idle. We skipped over the first verses when we looked at 1 Thessalonians because I knew that he would return to this important theme right at the end of 2 Thessalonians and I thought we'd take them together as we think about how the gospel changes the way we work and the way we think about our working life. So, the first reading is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9 to 12. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 to 12, the Apostle says this, Now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you, For you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more, making it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. And 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 from verse 6, 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 6, Paul says, In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive and does not live according to the teaching you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you. Nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, labouring and toiling, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we did not have the right to such help, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule, the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. We hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy, they are busybodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and to earn the food they eat. And as for you, brothers and sisters, never tire of doing what is good. Take special note of anyone who does not obey our instruction in this letter. Do not associate with them in order that they may feel ashamed, yet do not regard them as an enemy but warn them as you would a fellow believer. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with you all. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand, which is the distinguishing mark in all my letters. This is how I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word to us and we pray now that we would understand it well and that we would know how to apply the goodness and the grace of the gospel to our lives, to the problems of living and to how it is we work and why. And we ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Some of us can't wait to retire. Some of us hate the thought of retirement. Some stay-at-home parents cannot wait to get back to work. Others never go back to work. Work takes up an enormous amount of time for the average person. An enormous amount of time in our day and in our week. God said to Adam, it's good for you to work the ground. And he gave him work to do. But then one of the punishments for sin, punishments from God, was for him to say, now the ground will be full of thorns. 
and work will be frustrated. So is work good or is it bad? How do you find it? The poet Philip Larkin was a poet by night, was his passion in some ways, but he was also a librarian by day. Worked in a large university library and he ran that library. It was an important job. But he, he described his daytime work as an ugly toad in the poem Toads. He said this, Why should I let the toad work squat on my life? Can't I use my wit as a pitchfork and drive the brute off? Six days of the week it soils with its sickening poison just for paying a few bills. That's out of proportion. Ah, were I courageous enough to shout, stuff your pension. But I know all too well that's the stuff that dreams are made of. Some hate it. Some love it. Many of us more than love it, in fact. We worship it. We'll see how that works in a minute. But either way, most of us see work simply as a way to get money, and the more the better. Or we see it as a path to status with people. Or Perhaps neither of those, but as a path to self-fulfillment. One of those three things. The Bible's view of work is much better than any of those, and I hope you come to believe that today. We'll look at two things Paul associates with work. Love and restfulness. And then we'll try to understand how the gospel itself logically makes work both loving and an expression of our rest. Now, Paul clearly does not want the Thessalonian Christians to be idle or to be lazy. He says it over and over again. He does not want them to abuse other people's kindness just because they can't be bothered to work. But why is this important to him? What is work? First of all for Paul, work is an act of love to others. In 1 Thessalonians 4.10, he tells the Thessalonians to love each other more and more. And then verse 11 is not a new sentence as it is in some of our Bible translations. And it's not a new idea in Greek. Paul literally writes... Love each other more and more, comma, making it your ambition to lead a quiet life and to work with your hands. Your work is a way to love. Negatively, of course, sponging off other people is not loving, but more positively, the act of working is a positive act of love toward another person. Because what drives my desire Therefore, what drives my desire to put into my work is the good of others. It's not going to be the status I get. It's not going to be the money that I get. And it won't even be the self-fulfillment that I get. The driving motive and power of my work, according to Paul, is the good I give to another. Not that it makes mum and dad proud, not that it gets mum and dad off my back, but that I give some good to another. We'll explore the difference that makes to life in a few moments. An act of love. But the second thing Paul sees work as being seems paradoxical. He sees work as restful. A proper relationship to work will come from spiritual rest. And when you have a proper relationship to work, it is restful or quiet or brings peace and order. You get this sense when you learn that our word, the Bible uh, translates here as idle, can also mean disorderly. And in our reading, it was 
given as both, idle and disorderly. To not work is an act of disorder. It's chaotic. And we get a sense when Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 3.11 that lazy people are busybodies. You see that being lazy actually creates a kind of restlessness, disquiet or boredom or agitation that leads one to bother other people or complain to others. So Paul associates hard work, 1 Thessalonians 4.11, with quietness, or 2 Thessalonians 3.12, with being settled, settled. Though it is active, it is a kind of quiet and settledness. This is very interesting. Now, we can see how the love of work and the peaceableness and the restfulness of work go together and how they relate. The application here is not just for those that don't want to work, though that's what he's thinking of, but also for those who work too hard and who worship work. Worship work is the thing that provides them with their status and their identity. Or the person who just sees work as a way of getting money. All of those problems can be solved, if we're willing to solve them, by seeing work in the way that Paul describes it, as both an act of love and a means of rest. See, if you need your job in order to know who you are, if you need your job in order to think of yourself as a valuable person, that job is going to be stressful. That is an enormous burden to place on your work. And there'll be no peace in it. Work becomes the restless creation of myself. If I were to lose my job, I wouldn't even know myself. I might think I'm good for nothing. There is no peace in that. If, on the other hand, work for me is just a way of getting money, it becomes incredibly easy to resent that work when it provides me with no meaningful satisfaction. There's no peace in that either. The implications of Paul's view are really wonderful. To begin with, it dignifies all work. There's peace in this. Any work useful to others is a profound act of love. In the Roman world, if you worked with your hands as a labourer, it was considered lowly and degrading and embarrassing, according to the philosophers. But Paul says, work with your hands. Paul himself worked with his hands as a tent maker, as did the Lord Jesus, the carpenter. Physical work is good work, because it's for others. Any work for others is good. A builder does not simply work for pay, he works to provide safe housing for human beings. A garbage collector works to keep a suburb clean and free from disease. Installing air conditioners stops people being grumpy in summer and saves the lives of elderly people in a cold winter. These are meaningful acts of love. All right, Matthew, but what about me? I just flip burgers at McDonald's. I say to you, I'm grateful to you because I like McDonald's. There, I said it. It's cheap, it's clean, it tastes good. Is it particularly healthy? Who cares? Sometimes a treat from McDonald's will make my day. So I say, thank you, kid, cooking the fries. You help me. I'm deadly serious. In fact, when I wrote that in my sermon notes during the week, I got hungry just thinking about McDonald's. I went out and bought some. It was great. So why I go to work is changed. What I hope I'm giving to others in my work is changed. The way society rates certain workers valuable and other workers as not valuable, that is also totally upended by Paul. And the restfulness I can find in work when it is an act of love for other people, that is totally different to the uneasiness that you feel when work is just a way 
of getting other people to give you recognition or to give you money. I'll say that again. The restfulness I can find in work when I realize it is an act of love to others that is totally different to the uneasiness you feel when work is just a way of getting other people to give you recognition or to give you money. An act of love arising out of rest and peace. Now, how is it that work becomes for Paul these things? An act of love and quiet contentment. It is because, like everything in Thessalonians, the gospel has changed it. I mean, look at how Paul describes God and the Christians at the end of the letter. May the Lord of peace himself give you peace. Verse 18. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. A Christian's status is provided not by their work, but by Jesus. What peace? What rest? I am a saved person. I am loved and graced. God saves me because of the work Jesus did for me. Not any work that I do, practical or spiritual. My identity is rock solid in him, no matter what others think of me, no matter what others will pay me. And so my work takes on a whole new color. Nine to five, I realize, is not designed to reveal who I am or to show what I'm worth. That's freeing. It feels lighter. My work doesn't determine who I am. God has already secured an invincible status with him. Tim Keller says the difference here is well illustrated in the movie Chariots of Fire. And it was. I wonder if you remember it. Harold Abrams and Eric Little were both British sprinters going for gold at the 1924 Olympics in Paris. Harold works hard, but he is tortured by the possibility of failure. When he lost a race, it almost destroyed him because the job was him. He says, I've been chasing something my whole life and I hardly know what it is. But when I run that race, I've got 10 seconds to justify my whole existence. Eric, on the other hand, was a Christian. He later went to serve as a missionary in China. We see in the film how he can put a limit on his work. He doesn't have to run to know who he is. When the race is on Sunday, he won't run it, believing it's the Lord's day. It stings not to run, but it's okay. He doesn't have to run in order to know or to prove himself. But out of that freedom that he has, well, it allows him to run for another reason entirely. For pleasure. God's and his. He says to his sister, I believe God made me for a purpose and I will go to the mission in China. But I will run the race first if I can. Because I believe God also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. On the cross, Jesus has appeased the wrath of God. I never live or work to appease God. And that frees me to live and work to please God for his sheer pleasure in the good that my work does for other people. There is a world of difference between those two things. So the gospel gives me the peace and the status that so many people are looking for in their work and achievements. It gives me the sense of eternal security so many people are looking for in their work and achievements. It reminds me that God worked hard to bless me and that I'll only find real pleasure in working hard to bless others. 
again, the implications of this for our working life are huge. Of course, it means I'm not going to be lazy and cynical about my work. When I was a high school teacher, there was another teacher in the school and a mutual friend told me about this other guy's system. Every two or three or four weeks, he would take a sick day on a Monday or a Friday in order to give himself a long weekend. He'd do this until he used up his annual amount of sick days. Now, he wasn't sick. He was lying. He just wanted the time off. But his pattern was so clever and so seemingly random, you'd never notice unless you knew what he was doing. Why did he do this? Because to him, school was just a paycheck. The work was just a necessary evil. Now, his lies weren't free. They cost other people money, of course. He had to be replaced on all those days. He wasn't really sick. So his idleness was a burden to the school and was a way of eating someone's bread without paying for it. A gospel way of working puts an end to all that kind of cynical selfishness with respect to our work. I will work when no one else is watching because I work to please God more than I work to please others. William Barclay tells the story of a man who bought a house even without having inspected it. Somebody said to him, how do you know it's been built well enough? He said, I know the man that built that house and he builds his Christianity in with the bricks, with integrity. He knew that man built not just for himself, but for the common good, out of love. The gospel means we will not be lazy or cynical in our work. The gospel also gives us huge resources for coping with the difficulties of work. And there are many. There are bosses and there are colleagues who are cruel and who are unjust. There are times when I'm hugely disappointed because I want to work but I, I can't. I'm unemployed. But the gospel is a deep reservoir for coping. Coping with the problems of our working life. Why? Because I know. I remind myself that I know those problems cannot get at the thing in me that matters most, God's love of me and my love of others. Whatever blows my working life tries to inflict on my mental health or my sense of myself, I have the resources to cope. I know that in Christ I will be okay. I won't be lazy and cynical. I will have resources for coping. Lastly, the gospel allows me to avoid workaholism. Eric Little could put a boundary around his work as an athlete because it didn't define who he was. He didn't need it to be himself. We can do the same. We can place limits on our work because we know it is not our source of meaning or peace or status. How will you work? Will you try to avoid it if you can? Or on the other hand, will you enslave yourself to work? Because without it, you have no idea who you are or what you're worth. Here is something much greater. Find your real invincible identity in the grace and the love of God. And in that rest, begin to experience the satisfaction of knowing that your work is an act of love to others that brings pleasure to God. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the work you have done for us. For the work of salvation and the gift of life, which we do not deserve. Help us when we work. 
to work with love from a place of resting in you resting in you and resting in the grace of the gospel let us therefore work hard but with boundaries because our work does not define who we are or determine our identity. Let us learn to cope with the difficulties of work, and to cope with the resources of your inexhaustible acceptance and love. Teach us how to work as an act of love, to find rest in it, because we know the gospel. In Jesus' name, Amen.